we are coming into one of the more popular chapters in the book of Ezekiel. You notice that uh, many pastors or many teachers, they do not teach from the book of Ezekiel at all from chapter 1 to chapter 33. All right, so 33 chapters of Ezekiel hardly being talked about in the pulpit because they are quite uh, difficult and they all talk about the judgments of God and therefore uh, most uh, teachers shy away from these chapters. But come to 34 onwards, we are going to some of the most popular chapters in the book of Ezekiel now. 34, the return of the true shepherd, very popular chapter, especially uh, churches will use this chapter uh, to preach on when they are appointing uh, new leaders in the church, new cell leaders, when there's an ordination of new uh, pastors and so on. Uh, this is the favorite chapter of what a true shepherd is and what true shepherds should not be doing and so on. Right? So it's, it's a lovely chapter for us to go in as we prepare for next week. Okay, we, we are continuing next week. Uh, into the restoration of Israel, there needs to be this understanding of total dependency on our shepherd uh, in order for us to get into this, this uh, restoration times of the millennial kingdom uh, and so on. So we are entering into a very uh, exciting part of the book of Ezekiel uh, from today onwards. All right? So the lovely song on Psalm 23, a lot of sermons have been preached on it. Uh, you can go into YouTube and look at that. Uh, David grew up as a shepherd boy. You look at the life of David. And he spent years in the foothills of Judea looking after a sheep, uh, looking after his father's sheep. And from there, he gathered this lovely picture of how dependent sheep are upon the shepherd and how important it is for a shepherd to be vigilant and to take care of his sheep that tends to uh, be frightened right they are not dumb all right i'm not saying sheep are dumb uh, jesus calls us sheep a lot of times all right uh, the church we have always been uh, addressed as the sheep Sheep are not dumb, but they are dependent and they are weak. And they, uh, what do you call uh, Isaiah 43, uh, they tend to go astray, right? They tend to wander. And so David observing all these things has given us this beautiful uh, picture of, of the good shepherd, Psalm 23. He understood what it meant to be a responsible and a faithful uh, shepherd uh, to the flock, right? So this chapter looks at this, right? So Isaiah chapter 40 talks about th this good shepherd that's coming in the end times. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, all right? So Christ is often pictured as the chief shepherd, all right? Uh, and the true shepherd and the great shepherd. Uh, he will gather the lambs in his arm and he shall gently lead those who are with young. Right? It's a beautiful picture of God's heart and his care for his people. Right? And uh, John chapter 10, uh, Jesus himself explains what it means to be good shepherd. So go and read uh, John chapter 10 and you see all the characteristics of good shepherds and false shepherds back. Right? So he begins uh, the first few verses by denouncing the unfaithful shepherds that God has appointed to oversee his people, uh, the people of Israel. Right? So the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. So when you look at shepherds in the political sense or in the administrative sense or in the civil sense, they are the kings, the priests, uh, the prophets, right? So these are those that are God has appointed to oversee his flock, his sheep, right? So, so we are given instances of that in Numbers 27, 2 Samuel chapter 5, where David himself is being called a shepherd. 
uh, and Joshua in Numbers 27 is also called a shepherd of Israel and so on. So thus says the Lord God to the shepherds. Whoa, imagine. Second verse itself, there's this denunciation of these leaders that God has appointed. Woe to the shepherds of Israel, you feed yourselves only. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. I want to look at the word feed there. So some scriptures use the word tend. You do not tend to the flock. But the NKJV, the New King James Version and many Bible versions use the word feed, which is the actual uh, translation of the word there. You do not feed. So feed and tend has two different meanings. So when you talk of feed, it has something to do with nourishing the people with the word of God. You feed the people with the word of God. All right. So this is to differentiate it from the social concerns of the church. I'm not saying social concerns are not important. They are equally important, but the chief function of shepherds, and then we come back to Ephesians 4, 11, 12, the apostles, uh, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the pastors, right? So uh, these are all appointed leaders for the edifying of the church, to feed the church, to nourish the church. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Timothy chapter 5 says, yes, although these appointed leaders, they are to be taken care of by the congregation, or they need congregational support, but they should not take advantage of this support and forget right, their main calling right, to nourish and to, to, to take care of the flock. And that's where the unfaithfulness of the leaders of Israel is that God is uh, denouncing here. Okay? And, and so uh, here he's saying, all you leaders in Israel, you only care for your livelihood. And what you can get from the people in terms of taxes, in terms of 10% uh, uh, of all their crops and so on. And they do not care to feed the word to the flock. And therefore, the Lord pronounced the woe judgment on them. Okay, so listen friends, while not disregarding the social function of the church, especially during these difficult days uh, in our country, all right, especially during the recent flood in Shah Alam and so on, uh, we see a lot of social concerns in the church going out to help people in need. Very important, but the principal role, the spiritual role of the church is always to feed the flock. Okay, so while well, not dismissing. Uh, the importance of the NGOs and, and, and so on. All right? So, uh, if you remember, when Jesus restored Peter in John chapter 21, okay, do you love me, Peter, more than all this? He asked Peter three times, and every time when Peter confessed his love for the Lord, Jesus commissioned him into a wider and wider ministry, all right? If you look at John 31, what happened in the conversation between uh, Jesus and Peter, all right, after the breakfast of the fish by the Lake of Galilee, he said, Peter, feed my sheep. And then he said, tend my sheep. So there's feeding, there's tending. And then thirdly, he says, feed my lambs. That's Sunday school, <laughs> all right? So Peter, having rejected, right, uh, uh, during his betrayal, uh, during the trial of Jesus, was completely restored in repentance, and Jesus gave him an expanded ministry, widened him to be the leader of the church in Jerusalem, to take care of the sheep, to teach the sheep, and, and, and so on. So here is the role of a shepherd, feeding, tending, Feeding. Huh? So you can look at that in, in and, and therefore I like to look at this uh, word feed here in terms of nourishing, right? With sound doctrine, teaching the word of God. 
That's the principal role of what they meant by feeding. And you'll find that in Jeremiah chapter 3, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Okay. So uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 talks about this. We all, as leaders in the church, we have been appointed as under shepherd, under Jesus, who is the chief shepherd. All right. Shepherd the flock, which is among you, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, not for dishonest gain, there you go again, but willingly, neither as lording it over those entrusted to you. Jesus, Jesus mentioned this again in Matthew 20, we'll come to it afterwards, but making ourselves examples to the flock our conduct, our speech, our teaching, so that when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. So there is a responsibility there that Peter highlighted to the church. Okay. So here, verse 4 says this, the weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. You look, I highlighted those words all in, in brown there. That's the principal role of shepherds, to strengthen, to heal those that are sick, to bind up those that are broken, spiritually or physically, bring back those that have been backslidden or those that have stepped away and seek those that are lost. Okay, five principal functions there for a shepherd. But these shepherds instead are using force and cruelty to rule over the flock that God has placed over them. And because of that, the sheep have been scattered because there was no true shepherd there. And they have become food for all the beasts, prey to all the predators okay, of the field when they were scattered. My sheep, look at that word, my sheep, even though God has put the church under our care, people under our care as leaders of the church, remember, they are not our sheep, because God sees them as his sheep. We are just under shepherds, stewards, all right? So he says, but my sheep, and he is left this, this dismay on the unfaithfulness of the shepherd. My sheep have wandered through the mountains on every high hill. My flock has been scattered. See the word scattered there? Three times it's mentioned in this verse. Well, it was five. They were scattered. All right. And, and when the beasts of hill came, they were scattered. That's what happened to sheep. Any little bit of trouble, all right? Even though a rabbit runs across them, they all will scatter every which way. All right? Sheep are highly timid. And they scare easily, right? Now, those of you who are in Australia, New Zealand, uh, you are familiar with this, right? And and uh, my flock scattered over the whole face of the earth. Now, this is talking about the diaspora of the Jews now, okay? Over the whole face of the earth. Timid people completely gone. Huh? I, I like goats. Goats, because of their horns, uh, they tend to huddle together to face uh, uh, an approaching enemy. <laughs> but sheep, if you walk into a flock, they all scatter every which way. Huh? And, and no one, after they've been scattered, no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. So Matthew chapter 20 talks about this. When Jesus said, um, uh, Matthew 20, what happened there? Remember the, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, uh, 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 James and John, was asking Jesus that uh, in heaven to let James and John sit on the right side and the left side of Jesus in his kingdom. And Jesus reprimanded her and said, you don't know what you're asking and so on. And then he goes into this teaching that, uh, uh, you know, the lords of the Gentiles, they lord over their sheep, but not so among you. Right, those of you who wish to sit by my side, those of you who wish to be great, learn first to be a servant. Right, for who, he who, who wish to be first must first come to serve. Right, for the Son of Man has not come to, to be served, but 
to serve and give his life for his sheep. So that's Matthew chapter 20. Right? So even though leaders have that positions of respect in the church and so on, but remember, our calling is first of all to serve. All right, to serve. And that's not happening in Israel. So you, you find that uh, after the breakaway, King Jeroboam in the first Kings, and then all the children of Josiah, we, we looked at that through the first few chapters of Ezekiel, all of them were worthless, unworthy shepherds. All of them turned evil and led uh, the sheep away. All right, let Israel away. And remember in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the people of Israel demanded to have a king like the king of all the nations around, and Samuel warned them. Samuel warned them, you have a king, the king will take away. The king will, will lord it over you. The king will take 10% of all your income, of all your crops, uh, use all your sons to be soldiers and your daughters to be kitchen helpers and so on, and you will suffer all this. Uh, but the people didn't hear what Samuel warned them. And, uh, and true enough, that's exactly what happened to Israel under all these unfaithful kings. Huh? And therefore God says, uh, woe to, to them. Okay, so as I live, verse 8 says, surely because my flock, again, it's again, my flock, my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. Nor did my shepherds search for my flock. They are not just unfaithful, they are not caring. They don't care about sheep that have been scattered. But they only feed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear uh, the word of the Lord. So this is a very somber uh, word for all of us who are in leadership in the church. We have been looking at the responsibility of a watchman and how if a watchman failed in his duty, negligent, uh, the blood of the people will be upon his he head. So, so now we turn the focus not on the watchman, but on the shepherds, okay? And therefore we are told the sick and crippled sheep have been left unattended. Uh, strays have been left to wander and there is completely no concern at all among the leaders of Israel for these people. And therefore the sheep became prey to every predator in the field. And that talks in modern times, if we do not give good counsel and good teaching, uh, our church, the flock, will be open to deception. Jesus warns us of that, right? In, in the first sign of the end time, there will come false Christ deceiving the white horse in Revelation chapter 6, the church especially. And therefore, uh, we need to be able to feed and give full counsel of the word of God. That's the function and the calling of true shepherds. Okay, and um, Jeremiah chapter 15 talks about that. Okay, so look at this, my flock, my sheep. We have been stressing on that, right? So even though God has given the church to be under our care, we must remember it is his precious people, his precious sheep. Eh? And uh, so this is just a nice, uh, lovely cartoon that uh, I found uh, in the internet, uh, how we need to be uh, responsible there, okay? Um, so I bring you to some Old Testament uh, laws. Uh, Moses gave this... If anything happened to a sheep, remember shepherds normally take care of sheep that belongs to a, a, a landowner and so on. So if anything should happen to the sheep, the shepherd must produce some kind of proof that it was not his fault, that one of the sheep died or something like that. The Amos chapter 3 talks about this. The shepherd who managed to rescue only two legs or a piece of an ear out of a lion's mouth. Show the evidence that you have tried to rescue the sheep. So even though a predator has taken away the sheep, you are to take back, even though it's just a piece of leg or a piece of ear out from the lion's mouth. Show the evidence that you have tried to rescue the sheep. And that was in Exodus chapter 
22. All right, so one of the uh, laws that Moses gave to uh, of res being responsible to the landowner's uh, sheep. If it's torn by beast, let him bring it as evidence. Okay, uh, we see that uh, uh, these shepherds of Israel, these leaders, they couldn't care less what happened to the sheep. They can stray wherever they are. They have been eaten away by prey. And, uh, they are still in Starbucks for the care, all right? So, but you remember David, right? David, in First Samuel chapter 17, when when he came to Saul, all right? When he came to Saul and introduced himself to Saul to, uh, to fight uh, Goliath, and he said this, you know, your servant has chased after the lion and the bear and killed them because they have taken away your servant's sheep. Right, so David did not just produce an ear, he killed the bear, he killed the lion as evidence that he had tried to protect the sheep. So that's where uh, this story of his uh, killing bears and sheep comes from. The responsibility to show evidence that you have taken care of the sheep. And therefore God says this, thus says uh, the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherd and I will require, I will require my flock at their hand. God will hold us responsible. And I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep. God's going to remove that uh, responsibility from them. And that's why you see Nebuchadnezzar uh, coming in and taking them away. Yeah? And the shepherds and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. Uh, you, you have been earning uh, your wages uh, irresponsibility. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. God is personally will rescue his, his flock because they are my sheep, right? So the return of the two shepherds. So now from verse 11, uh, there's a shift now, all right, to the return of Christ now, all right? He will be the, the true and faithful shepherd. For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself, you don't want to search for my sheep, I will do it, right? I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. Jesus himself is going to come. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day, he is among his scattered sheep. Now, this is a very important verse here. What's John? On the day he comes, he will come and search for all his sheep. That's why he sent his four angels out to the four corners of the earth, bringing in the elite, yeah? the sons of God. So uh, all the scattered sheep, Isaiah 3, all right, uh, all we like sheep, we have gone astray, but he's going to bring them back. I'll seek out my sheep and I will deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark Day. Now, why did Ezekiel put that again? So, so I highlight that in red. This is talking about end times again. So when you see of dark days, dark clouds, cloudy day, this this is the, the, the end time language. Right? Of Psalm 97, Joel chapter 2, Zephaniah chapter 1, all talks about this dark clouds uh, in the day of his return. Right? So he is going to come on that day and he'll bring back all the sheep. All right, I'll shall bring them out from all the peoples, not from Babylon, right? From all the countries and bring them back into their own land. Now we'll look at that next next week, all right? Next week, we're going to look at it, how uh, the Lord starts to bring them back uh, from all the different countries back into their own land today. And this is a rule that Jacob himself has prophesied to his son Joseph in Egypt, that he shall be a shepherd unto his people, right? So the prophecy of Joseph is very good. He will be an overhanging branch of vine to feed his people, but he will also be that, that shepherd, right? In Psalm 23, we have just seen just now, and um, uh, John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd himself. Huh? Uh, Jesus proclaims himself to be that good shepherd. So the shift now focuses not on Israel during uh, the days of Nebuchadnezzar. This is going into 
uh, into the, uh, the end days itself, the end time. Huh? So God himself would once again act directly as Israel's true shepherd. Okay? He's the chief shepherd. We looked at that in 1 Peter chapter 5 just now. The Messiah is coming. Okay, The perfect shepherd, the good shepherd, the great and chief shepherd. All right? The leaders of Israel has failed. The leaders of the church have failed. The Messiah will come, but he will not fail. So Luke chapter 15 says, even though there is one sheep lost, he will go and search for that one sheep, leaving the 99 sheep and searching for that one sheep that has gone astray. All right, so this is talking about his salvation uh, for all. Right? Uh, he is uh, patient and not willing that any should perish. We are not looking at 99 whom he left behind. We are looking at that one that has gone astray. Even that one, God does not neglect. Right? He wants them all to return to him. Uh, and that's the heart of God. Okay? And the story of the lost coin and the prodigal uh, son. All these three parables are all together in Luke chapter 15 itself. But they all talk about the same thing, returning to God. The father waiting for the prodigal son while the other brother, the elder brother, just couldn't care less. All right? So the elder brother is looking at that negligent uh, shepherd who doesn't care what happened to his younger brother. But the father, right? Keep looking, keep looking for the son that would return. Same thing, yeah? Uh, picture here. So, uh, Luke 19 talks about the son of man. He has come to seek and save that which was lost. And that's always God's plan. He will come and he will bring back his people. Yeah? So, looking at this, uh, a quick uh, summary here. We have been looking at watchmen, the call of the watchmen to be responsible, to warn of coming uh, coming enemies, to the shepherd, taking care of God's sheep, right? And to give the word properly to his flock as food. Huh? And we are told here that shepherds will be held accountable. I will require of you huh, to be accountable for the treatment of my sheep, God said. Huh? And uh, finally, um, uh, God is still calling the people, even though they have been exiled to Babylon and all over the world, God still recognizes them as my sheep, my flock. Three, four times it was mentioned there. God never let go uh, of his care, even when he sends them out to Babylon. Right? Even through there is this uh, judgment of being evicted uh, from Israel for 2,500 years now, he has not forgotten his people. All right? So no matter what they have done, what the people of Israel has done, no matter what the, uh, the Jews have done today in rejecting uh, the Messiah, he still looks at them and he says, I want my sheep to come home, right? That's his heart. I want to gather all of you back into the land that I promised your father, Abraham. Okay, so that's that's a beautiful thing. And, and therefore we, as a church, as the bride of Christ, uh, together with the people of Israel, like the sheep that have gone astray, uh, we need to be sensitive, right? Sensitive to hear his voice. Uh, the sheep faithfully follows where uh, the shepherd leads. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they will follow me. Okay? Right. So I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. This is talking about the millennial kingdom now. Right? So after his return, he's going to put them back into Israel and I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, in all the inhabited uh, places or country, I'll feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in peace, in contentment, right? Uh, in a good fold and feed in rich 
pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself, right, since you all have failed in your duties, I myself will feed my flock. I myself will make them lie down in green pastures. That's the song Psalm 33 says. So here is the trust that we have on the Good Shepherd to be content, to be at peace, to know that he watches over us. John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheepfold. All right, so when, when during the night, he'll take the sheep into a sheepfold, an enclosure or a cave all right, or a corral, and the shepherd himself will lie down at the entrance to the sheepfold. And when the sheep sees the shepherd lying down or standing there on guard at the sheepfold, they know that they can now rest, contented, secure. And that's what a shepherd does, right? He sleep so that no prey can come in and, and no predator can come in and steal away uh, the sheep during the, the night. And Jesus gives us the assurance that he is he, the door, standing guard over, over us. Remember Job? Right? When Satan wanted to destroy Job, uh, because Job was such a good servant to God, uh, God says you can do anything to him, but you can't do this. Right? So there, there is a certain, there's always a limit that God sets there. He's at the gate. He will not allow any uh, a danger, any harm uh, to come to his sheep. And therefore, First Peter chapter five says this: All, all of us, like sheep, uh, we need to be sober, vigilant, uh, because your devil walks around about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But only with God's permission, right? He can't, he can't touch um, us when God sets limits, just as he did against uh, uh, Satan when Satan came to seek to destroy Job. Okay, and verse 16, I will search for the loss, bring back the strays, I will bind up the injured, right? so these are all the, the role of a good shepherd, strengthen the weak, I give you the five roads, it sounds good here, say, I will do it, you refuse to strengthen them, you refuse to heal them, you refuse to bind them uh, of their broken legs and so on, I will do all this myself, and then he says this, I will destroy, I will shepherd the flock, with justice and as for you O flock thus says the lord god behold i shall judge between sheep and sheep between rams and goats so now god's uh, uh, pronouncement is not to the shepherds anymore he is now talking to the sheep directly to us All right so at first he was leveling his uh, displeasure on the leaders of the church on the leaders of Israel, but now he's talking to us as a sheep, right? So even among us, what I call, there are some renegade sheep among us, those who exploit others, the weaker ones in our midst, right? So here's what he says, justice will be done. You think you can get away by exploiting other weaker, weaker sheep in your midst? I see everything and I will judge. All right, so Matthew 25 talks about how he separate the goats from the sheep on the left side, and this is called the judgment of nations. The nations are people, all right? And, uh, and, and he sees through everything. All right, so it's a question here. Are we to judge one another? This is talking about he himself will judge the sheep, not us, not us. Huh? Uh, we can judge ourselves, but we are not to judge others. Let him be the judge. And here's another picture here. Sheep matter more to the shepherd than the under shepherds himself. Right? His priority is always his people. Right? And we have been appointed as stewards of his people. Make sure we do it responsibly. That, that is a stern um, caution to those whom he has appointed as leaders. Uh, in the church. And here we see uh, a picture of the love of God and his heart for his sheep. No shepherd can function, responsibly can function uh, uh, 
pleasingly to the Lord if we cannot extend that love to the sheep. And no sheep can live without experiencing that love that he has commanded us to share. Or failing which he himself will do it. That's what he said here. Huh? Now, this is where he is unhappy with the sheep. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must stomp down the residue of your pasture and to have drunk of the clear waters and then you must foul up the residue with your feet? As for my flock, they eat what you have trampled on and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, to all this wicked sheep, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. Okay, so this gives us a picture of the greed of human nature. All right. So once we feed ourselves of the good pasture, we become strong. Uh, with our strength, we tend to push aside the weaker one and deprive them of the same blessings that we have enjoyed from God. We push down others in order that we may elevate ourselves and keep the blessing to ourselves and not share it to others. So we trample on the good pastures and we, we muddy up the fresh water after we have drunk it so that other sheep may not enjoy the same blessings that we have. Okay? So with your new power, you stop the weak from getting what they want. So this talks about not just spiritual leaders in the country or in the church, but also the civil administrative leaders in our country. All right, and you, you see all these things that are happening uh, today when you come to civil uh, leadership. They, they keep all the, all the riches for themselves and they don't pass it down to the people. Right, more so in the church today. Well, we need to be careful for that. So however well disguised uh, your actions may be, our greed, our perversity cannot stay hidden forever because he watches. He watches and he says, I myself will judge. Okay, so because you have pushed with side and shoulder, you have pushed away all the weaker sheep. You have butted away all the wicked ones with your horns. You have scattered them abroad. All right? So instead of helping them, you have done all this to deprive others. Therefore, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will establish one shepherd over them. This is Jesus saying, I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them. My servant, David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. Now, this is a very, very important verse for you to take notice. Who is this that God will appoint to be that one shepherd over Israel in the end time? So he sheep in the millennial kingdom. He says, my servant, David. Okay. Now, a lot of, a lot of uh, teachers say that this is referring to the Messiah himself. Uh, often, Jesus himself is being labeled as the branch of David, as the root of David. Uh, we are told that. But this one, he said, my servant. This is not the son of, son of David. He's a servant, my servant. The servant of God himself, which is David himself. So how many of us can look at this verse and say, will David be there in the end times, in the 1000 year millennial kingdom, and God will resurrect him, and he will rule over Israel, his sheep, in Jerusalem. While the Lord, the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, will rule over the world, the millennial kingdom, or in the end times, David himself. We talked about Revelation 20 verse 4, all right? And uh, we shall all be raised back to life and shall reign with him 1,000 years, Revelation 20 verse 4. So we talked about ourselves being raised to reign with Christ for 1,000 years. So if we can be raised to reign with Christ over 
your city block maybe or be the uh, the street to take care of your the, the sheep along your street where you live why not david why not David? If God can raise us in the first resurrection, when he comes again, all those who are dead in Christ shall be raised. Why not David? We have never thought of that. Okay? And there are verses that talked about this, that David will be reigning. Uh, here is the verse there, Isaiah 55, Jeremiah 30. We are going to come to it again next week or two weeks from now. Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dry bones, when uh, David himself will come and rule over them. Okay, and Hosea chapter 3, 5. So are we, uh, there, there is a different school of uh, interpretation here. This is not talking of Jesus. This is talking of the man, the king, David himself, who will now be the under shepherd over Israel. Well, Jesus himself is the chief shepherd over the millennial kingdom. Possible. Yeah? So just leave that possibility uh, uh, with you. Then he goes into this millennial kingdom. Ezekiel said, and I, the Lord, will be their God. All right? I, the Lord Jesus, will be their God. And my servant, David, will be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Right, so this is the literal fulfillment of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promises uh, the throne uh, of Israel will be upon uh, David himself. And then he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. Uh, this is the everlasting covenant, right? the new covenant that Jeremiah 33 is equal to is talking about. Sorry. Uh, to replace the counterfeit covenant that Antichrist will be making with the nations uh, in the end times. So this is the real covenant of peace, um, not the Abrahamic Accord. All right? So this is the God's covenant of peace. And he'll cause all the wild beasts to cease from the land. Creation being restored. Romans 8.20. Right now, creation is groaning, right? Waiting for the liberation of the sons of God. And when Christ comes again, that groaning, that uh, imprisonment will be set free and creation will be restored, right? The lion will not roar at the lamb anymore, right? And they will dwell safely in the wilderness and they will sleep together in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing and I'll cause showers to come down in their season. This is the early rain and there shall be showers of blessing. You remember the song? Okay, showers of blessing. So this is uh, the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31. The final peace, the eventual peace that God will bring back to planet Earth, which Adam and Eve have lost since the Garden of Eden. All right, and Romans eight twenty is talking about that. All right, so that's the Messianic age and Eden restored. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield of her increase. They shall be saved in their land, the sheep. They shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke, captivity, right, and delivered them from the hand of those who have enslaved them for the past 2,500 years, since 586 BC until today. And they shall no longer be prey for the nations, nation, not Babylon, nor shall beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely and no one shall make them afraid anymore. And this is not talking about the return from Babylon. Although people who don't believe in the prophetic is talking about the coming back from Babylon, God never restored Israel when they came back to Babylon like this. All right, as, as, as these verses say. Neither is it talking about today, although we see uh, Israel blossoming today. We are going to look at that next week. All right, but today Israel is still living under uh, all the harassments of the Palestinians and pressure from America and Russia now is warning uh, uh, Israel for bombing Syria yesterday. Uh, there is still no peace for my people there. 
this is talking about the 1000 year reign already huh? and uh, so what we're going to look at is this just give you a quick look at at uh, isaiah 3 isaiah 6 and so on it all talked about this uh, isaiah 60 and so on talked about the restoration of the land of Israel itself. Nature is going to be transformed, not just Israel, but the whole world actually, uh, climate is going to be restored. The earth's curse because of sin uh, in Genesis 3, that disappears while animals will lose their ferocity. They will live in harmony with humans. Isaiah chapter 11, the biosphere becomes lush, all right, fruitful again, no need for pesticides, there will be abundant uh, food production, uh, whereas today we are talking of food sh uh, shortages and famine that's coming. But look at Isaiah 35. So go home and read all these chapters there, uh, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 60, and so on. You'll find all these beautiful promises of uh, the Millennial Kingdom in Revelation chapter 20. All right, so Revelation chapter 20 talks about this, all this restoration. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down together with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling, they will all live together, and a little boy will lead them. Okay, Isaiah 11. Also the cow and the bear, they will graze together, the young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like ox. Right? Uh, and uh, the infant uh, will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hands into the viper's nest, and they will neither harm nor destroy at all, all on my holy mountain. Okay, creation restored. Isaiah 65, I told you there's another. No longer will baby die, will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life, 120 years, Moses, no longer will people be considered old at 100. Hello, brothers and sisters, you're all still very young. Uh, only sinners will die. Okay, so earth is going to be restored and we are going to have people like Methuselah, 969 years, the oldest living man on earth, and Jared, 930 over the second I think Jared is Methuselah's grandfather. Uh, Jared is the father of Enoch. All right, so all these people live long lives, and earth is going to be restored uh, to this. Okay, and I will raise up for them a garden of renown. They shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of Gentiles anymore. All right, all the anti-Semitic. Uh, thorns on Israel, on the Jews today. All that will be taken away. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God. You are my flock, my sheep. Okay? The flock of my pasture, you are man. How to interpret this? You are not sheep. All right? I call you sheep, but in the end times, you are man. Grow up to be strong. All right? All right? I have made you strong again. You are man and I am your God, says the Lord God. The other way to put it, there's always this, this, uh, we will always be man. We can never be God. All right? So some, 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 uh, uh, leaders think that they are God themselves, like the kings of Tyre, like Pharaoh that we saw. Or we are still men. But we are no longer timid and uh, frightened sheep of the pasture. All right? Uh, that's his assurance to us. And this is the promise of the covenant of Abraham that will be fulfilled uh, in the millennial kingdom. I will make thee a great nation, Israel, and I will bless thee. I'll make thy name great. You shall be a blessing. All that will be fulfilled during. Uh, Christ return, and I will bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee. We see that in operation today, and in thee, all the families of the earth will be blessed through Christ. All right, Christ comes from that line through Christ. Uh, that blessings come, and 
and Christ is going to return and fulfill all these blessings in Genesis chapter 12. All right, so this is a, another way of looking at Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. All right, so rather than looking at Psalms 23 verse by verse, I'm taking a look at this, the good shepherd in the end times. All right, so do not be discouraged if, if, if the Lord is calling us his sheep. We are to be. We tend to go astray, okay? Um, but thank God, okay? Thank God he is the good shepherd who gives us that security, who leads us beside quiet waters so that we are not uh, put to fear and we do not uh, scatter uh, easily, but faithfully listen to the shepherd's voice and follow him. Because in him is our eternal security. Okay, so Father, we want to uh, thank you for uh, this evening together. Thank you for this opportunity to, to dig into uh, your scriptures uh, that you have so blessed us with uh, today. And uh, we want to thank you, Father, that uh, you have a great purpose, a great promise for all your people, Israel, as well as the church, the bride of Christ, you have a plan and, and um, we follow you as our great shepherd. And we know that all the plan uh, you will fulfill in the end. And we thank you, Father, that even though we enter into these dark days ahead of us, we look at all the birth pangs that are happening around us today. Uh, Yet, Father, we thank you for your assurance to us in John chapter 16. You have overcome the world and in you there will be peace. Peace that surpasses understanding when we learn uh, to heed your voice. Listen to you and follow you as our shepherd. So, Father, uh, Prepare our hearts, ready our hearts, Father, and, and help us to stand strong in our faith in you, refusing to compromise, uh, refusing to bend uh, our knees to the ways of the world, but that we will stand firm in our faith in you, helping us to, to teach your word to feed the sheep that you have placed under us, that we may be worthy under shepherds for you, that when we meet you again, you will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Help us, Father, to be prepared, Father, to answer the questions of those around us, especially as we go into these dark days, of the peace and the hope that we can find in you the, the trust and the security that we have in you, despite the chaos that's happening around us. And help us, Father, to do it gently and, and respectfully, Father, for uh, it is through your gentleness that people will be drawn to you uh, in repentance. So guide us, Lord, as we look to you to be, to, to empower us by your spirit to be that shining light for you in these dark days that people can see that hope in us, that confidence that we are your sheep in trusting you and that they themselves will be drawn to this light that shines forth from Calvary. We bless you. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so next week, uh, we'll continue next week, okay? Uh, next week, uh, next uh, week, we'll be looking at um, what can I say? Ezekiel chapter 36, okay? Please go home and read 36, uh, the re-establishment of the nation of uh, Israel. Okay, so, so I won't take a break. I have just done up my slides this morning. I got it all done. I thought I couldn't get it done in time. Uh, so 
uh, we'll look at this uh, coming week and uh, be prepared for it because we are going into um, the modern history of Israel and how uh, Israel uh, was born again as a nation in a single day. May 14, 1948. We are approaching the birthday of uh, the Independence Day of, of Israel itself on May 14 next week. It's the right time. The timing is perfect for us to go into this next week. So, all right, so we'll see you next week. And let me stop sharing if you have any questions. Yes, okay. <laughs>